Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Welcome back. This is Theology in Perspective, and I'm Dr. Daniel Woodhead. I'm blessed that you could join us again today for our study in the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of the Lord Jesus. We are concluding the third chapter, and uh, the chapters two and three have been the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. And we've noticed that each of these churches got a report card from the Lord Jesus. And in those report cards, there were condemnations, commendations, and general discussion of the um, church and what they were doing. Now, there's three levels of understanding. These are real churches that have historical basis of fact. They had real problems and these churches and the problems they have exist today in uh, local congregations. We have similar problems in different areas of this world that uh, are attesting to uh, Christianity. So those are two levels and I've chosen to spend most of our time on the third level which is the representation of each of these churches to a particular historical period of Christianity. And the one that we ended with last time was the Church of Laodicea. And uh, we're going to continue on with that church because it represents quite a long period of time, starting uh, roughly around 1900, 1914 or so. And that period of time represents the apostasy. And if you remember, the Lord Jesus said that he will spew you out of his mouth. Because this church is hot? No. Cold? No. Just they didn't care. That's worse. That is worse. And we concluded in our last session with a uh, set of verses from a Second Peter. And uh, the, that ended with uh, Peter saying, It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. And he said, but it has happened unto them according to one true proverb. The dog is turned from its own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now there isn't any, any love or toleration for apostates in uh, Peter. Peter portrayed these folks as having destructive denials. Now, you know, the teaching of the apostates are called destructive denials because um, the content denies even the master that bought them. In, in other words, in other words, the person, the master and work, he bought us of the Lord Jesus. You know, there's other New Testament passages that provide more specific aspects of this denial First, there's a denial of the Trinity that's dealt with in 1 John 2, verses 22 to 23, where John says there, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Now, 1 John 4, verses 2 to 3, comments on a denial of the Incarnation. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And the same is true of Second John 1 John 1.7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now, the third thing that I want to show you here is that they deny the second coming of the Messiah. Now that's a, a, a major concern here of Second Peter 3, verses 3 to 4. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, 
Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So the teachings of apostasy involve several things. One, destructive denials of the person and the work of the Messiah, our Lord Jesus. And this is especially with regard to his place in the Trinity, his deity, his incarnation as the God-man by the virgin birth, and the fact that he's coming again physically, physically, not spiritually, although his spirit will be here too, but he's physically returning. Now, the, the, um, the fundamental element to all these denials is the denial of the inspiration of the scriptures themselves. Because once a person moves away from accepting the authority of scripture, all the rest of it that's there that can protect us won't because they stop looking at the other doctrines. It's very easy, very easy for somebody to turn away from the Bible if you can convince them that one part or another is not true. And this has happened. Go back to the mid-1850s, Julius Wellhausen convinced the elite intelligentsia in the high-level Ivy League schools here and the academically uh, proud schools in Europe that the first five books of the Bible were not written by Moses. Doesn't matter that Jesus said they were. Wellhausen convinced people in academia and millions dumbed down the Bible and didn't take it as authoritative. So you move away from the scripture you move away from the scripture and all the safeguarded doctrines that are there to safeguard us are ignored and they don't help anymore. Now, what do the apostates do? Well, they mock. They mock. Jude 17 to 19. I remember Jude is just a one chapter book. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who are going to walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. So they're going to mock the fundamentals of the faith, such as the verbal inspiration of scripture, virgin birth, the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus, his physical resurrection from the dead, because 2 Peter 3, verses 3 to 8, say, say, er, er, says that <clears throat> they're going to mock even the doctrine of the second coming. The doctrine of the second coming. And that's what we just read. These scoffers, these scoffers, they say, where's the promise of his coming? For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that was then, whereby overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So the second deed that they do here is they create these schisms, or these separations, Jude 19, because they begin denying some of the fundamentals of the faith. You know, they can convince some, but not all. In the course of time, this produces a big split within the church. Throughout this age of apostasy, the Laodicean age, there has been schism after schism, split after split, church after church, and denominations have split over denials of the Trinity, the incarnation of the second coming, and others. The characteristics of these heretical teaching, teaching and, 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 and these deeds of separation have become prevalent. Church history has progressed from about 1900 or so, uh, maybe even around the time of the First World War, 1914, to the present date. Now, this is the age of apostasy. There has always been apostasy, but not in the magnitude that it is today. And I'd mentioned uh, 
starting in Europe with German. <coughs> the German rationalism and the inerrancy of Scripture was denied with the development of this documentary hypothesis of Julius Wellhausen. He and Dr. Graf decided that, well, human reason only, not the Bible, could be trusted. And he presented the idea that the Bible is far from being God's word. It's just a collection of human documents. And this particular contribution to what we call the closing of the book was a denial of the authorship of the first five books of the Bible by Moses. As I said, God in Jesus said that Moses wrote the first five. The New Testament has those words. But uh, these people apparently didn't give Jesus himself any credibility. So there you have another denial. You see? Now, Dr. David Brees in his book, The Seven Men Who Rule the World from the Grave, says that these destructive heresies that came in to the church caused the church leader to quote everything except the Bible, and they preached everything but the gospel. According to Dr. Brees, reality was gone. Religious liberalism was born. Now, he, now Brees continues. It's really interesting because he ties the calamities that came into Europe, such as communism, Nazism, fascism, and the emergence of the world of occult and a, a, another number of other diseased ideas that have been promulgated because of the absence of a spiritual core made of divine life and spiritual blessing. You know, Wellhausen and his liberalism destroyed the spiritual life in Europe. It nearly succeeded in the spiritual destruction of the United States. Today, less than 1% of the population of Europe is made up of evangelical Christians. I think that's growing because of the problems they're having there. But it's still minimal compared to what it was. You know, and if you think that men are not able to negatively influence others to keep them out of the kingdom, listen to what the Lord Jesus had to say to the Pharisees. Matthew 23, 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourselves, neither you suffer ye them that are entering to go in. It's just that simple. The apostates keep others out. And some people would say, well, they can't do that. Well, they can, and they do it, and we have to be aware of what they're doing. I've heard people say things like, well, I don't have to pay attention to that. Uh, advertising works. If it didn't work, people wouldn't spend millions of dollars advertising their products and services. And this has been promulgated all over the world. And it went out from Germany, and it went into all of their prestigious universities, and people bought into it. It was a new academia-type following. They did it. Came over here, and it just polluted the big universities here, the Ivy League schools. Liberals like to stay in some thing they call a church. It's like a plague, though. It exists within us, and it seeks to deny the fundamentals of the faith. They don't believe the Bible, but they, and they've got fine doctrinal statements, but they don't believe any of it. They want real Christians to think of them as one of us. It, it's diseased ideas. And it's a rule of life that liberals do not leave the visible church. Of course, they're not part of the invisible church, the genuine church but they are part of the visible church. So they stay and they continue to spew out their poison to whomever they can get to hear it. They attempt to create doubt in the marginal believer, the one that's becoming a believer. They attempt to create doubt. They try and influence the one where the Lord Jesus says the seeds did not fall on good ground in the parable of the sower from Matthew 13. This is Satan continuing to impart doubt into the minds of those with marginal faith. Now I'm going to take you back to Genesis, Genesis 3, verse 45. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. 
For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. <laughs> in other words, Satan never denied God. He just created doubt. He created doubt, and that's the effective way that people get turned away from genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Doubt has entered their mind, and now they just don't know which way to go, so they don't do anything. It's easier. Many have written about a significant event in uh, human Christianity that occurred in the late 1800s. It is in the Encyclopedia Britannica, and my uh, seminary professors had introduced me to this. And this is a, uh, an event that is worthy of repeating because it is a pivotal event. Union Theological Seminary in New York used to be a seminary that prepared pastors for Presbyterian pulpits and seminary uh, work. And uh, uh, in 1891, January the 20th, a man named Charles Augustus Briggs, he's a Hebrew scholar, and we still use his, uh, his, his, his works, his works, um, <clears throat> regarding Hebrew. Uh, but his theology was so corrupt and so liberal. <laughs> In his inauguration speech on January the 20th, 19, or 1891, he made several points that you have to classify as a destructive heresy. Now, this is what happened. Look, this is what he said, and this caused a serious split. He stated that there are three great equal fountains of truth. The Bible, the church, and reason. Who's the church? <clears throat> now, he's talking about uh, some ecclesiastical authority, the visible church. So reason and mankind became equal with the revealed word. Not true. Some Old Testament prophecies, he said, were fulfilled, and some were reversed. Not true. No evidence for that. He questioned the Mosaic authorship of the first five books of the Bible. Questioning them just throws doubt, you see. He didn't deny them, because they all knew what Jesus said. But the scholarship thing was so fun, and uh, these guys weren't real believers in the first place, so they would not have done this. See, an apostate is not a genuine believer. Apostates have characteristics that look like believers, but they're not. He questioned the unity of the book of Isaiah. And he also said that anybody who died who was unsaved would have a second chance of eternal life. There is no evidence for that whatsoever. And he also said that sanctification means our growth and development in Christ, our Christ-likeness, if you will, was not complete at death. Bible doesn't say that. Paul says we're glorified at death. Sanctification is complete. Now, at that time, they were referring to liberalism as modernism. Now, that's the first time there was a public affirmation of this. It had been going on since the mid-1800s in Germany and in the prestigious universities. The New York Presbytery brought charges against Briggs two times, 1891 and 1893, but typically, in typical fashion, they dropped the charges because they wanted to preserve unity rather than actually deal with the heretical concept. And I have to tell you, in no weak terms, truth must never be sacrificed for peace. It never works. Truth must never be sacrificed for peace. It never, ever works. So the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church put Briggs on trial in 1893, and he was suspended. And as a result, uh, he became an Episcopalian. The Union Theological Seminary withdrew from the Presbyterian Church and became independent. But they still continued to train ministers for Presbyterian pulpits. And this set the stage for the way the apostasy is going to develop in the course of the 20th century and beyond. Apostasy would first begin in a denominational school, 
and it would affect the training of ministers who were to fill pulpits uh, of the churches in those denominations. So eventually, more and more liberals took over the pulpits, and more and more churches became liberal themselves. So throughout the 20th century, at least the first two decades, the apostasy took over the schools and it trained ministers for these denominational schools. And <laughs> in an effort to try and stop this, in 1910, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church issued the Five Fundamentals of the Faith. And that uh, was called the uh, Inspiration of Scripture, the Virgin Birth, the Substitutionary Atonement, the Resurrection of Jesus, and the Miracles of Jesus. Now, that fundamentals, if you will, uh, was a new term that were given. So, anybody that subscribed to these uh, labels were called a fundamentalist. And it was a new word coined. The ones that denied these fundamentals were called modernists or liberals. We would call them today progressives. The General Assembly issued these in 1910, reaffirmed them in 1916 and 1923. Now, um, Dr. Mal Couch, uh, maybe 15 years ago or so, reissued another book, The Fundamentals, with uh, much discussion from scholarly input of others uh, characterizing the um, fundamentals of the faith. So you've got, in 1920s, let's go back to 1920s here, you've got this decade of this modernist fundamental battles, and they were battling. There was many attempts to fight, fight this within the church. But toward the end of the decade, it was really apparent that the modernists were taken over. They got control of both the denominational church positions that's all of modern denominations, or major denominations, except for the Southern Baptist Convention, in their schools, too. So that's the separatist movements of the 30s. The fundamentalists pulled out of the denominations and started their own denominations, or independent churches, emerging from the United Presbyterian Church of the United States of America was a group led by J. Gresham Macon. And that even split. Orthodox Presbyterian, Bible Presbyterian, and Evangelical Presbyterian. Then there were internal struggles. Uh, out of the Baptist Convention, American Baptist Convention, came the General Association of Regular Baptists. Out of the United Methodist Church came the Evangelical Methodists. The splits, the schisms that the Bible predicted would occur because of apostasy. And it began to occur in the separatist movements of the 1930s. You know, what's interesting. <clears throat> when you have a local congregation that's made up of a group of people that believe different things, sooner or later, you're either going to dumb down which comes from the pulpit to accommodate men, be a men-pleaser, it's exactly what Paul tells us not to be in Galatians, or you're going to have a split. Either way, Satan wins. Now, what has to happen is the Bible needs to be taught clearly in your church. And I tell you, it doesn't matter if you lose people. You're pleasing God, and that's what you're supposed to do. Look what Jude, again, 17 to 19 says, But be ye beloved, remember ye the words which have been spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ that they said unto you, in the last time there shall be mockers walking after their own ungodly lust. They are they who make separations sensual, not having the spirit. Sensual, not having the spirit. you got to remember that. That's exactly what the problem is. The Lord's spirit is not there. You know, ecumenical, or the tying together of other groups, <clears throat> have uh, been characterized since the 1940s. 1948, the World Council of Churches was organized on two principles. First, unity of all churches on the basis of liberal ideologies. And second, the unity of all religions, which is even crazier. In 1950, the old Federal Council of Churches was reorganized in the National Council of Churches, Again, attempting to unify all churches in the United States 
along these liberal ideologies, these liberal tenets. Consequently, the visible church, primarily apostate today, even among conservative denominations, some can already see the threat of apostasy taking over the school's supplying of liberal ministers to the pulpits. The Southern Baptist Convention has not fully escaped this, but uh, they have been, uh, they've been struggling with these things. Now, in more recent times, the apostasy has entered a whole new phase. Uh, the old phase was uh, characterized as destructive denials. The new phase claims to affirm the fundamentals of faith, but they've made a big paradigm shift and because the Bible is no longer the final authority in determining divine truth, but experience is equally valid. So, in actual practice, the experience takes priority over Scripture. The Bible contradicts the practice, then the practice is justified as a new move of the Spirit. And therefore, what the text of the Scripture actually says can be contradicted by a new experience. Yeah, this is a far more spiritual way of denying the truth of God, and therefore it's even more deceptive. The Spirit of God will never move in a manner that's contrary to Scripture. Now, I'm going to leave off there for today, and we'll pick this up because I have quite a bit more to talk about here regarding uh, the apostasy and this church at Laodicea and uh, how it is that uh, things have opened up, if you will, revealed themselves, uh, somehow or other have changed since uh, we entered this period about the time of the First World War. Beloved, if you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead, you genuinely believe that God's Spirit will enter you, and you will be, as the Lord Jesus said, born again. If you have made that decision, we would be blessed to be able to send you a small booklet at no cost. We will not follow up with you. We will not bother you. We want you to know what the overall plan of God is and how you fit into it. The Lord wants you to be with him when you leave this body and you go to heaven. And every one of us is leaving. But your decision is dependent on truth that there is a Jesus. He did die for your sins. And the fact that when you leave this body, you're going somewhere. Make it paradise. Make it with God by believing that Jesus died and rose again from the dead. Call the number on your screen, email us or mail us, and we'll be happy to send you out this brochure, this little pamphlet actually. God bless you and I look forward to being with you in our next session. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the Dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you.